Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. Are you ready to get cool with Coolidge? Because we're gonna bang out the 1924 election, guys. Much like the 1912 election, except this time, it's gonna be the Democrats that are gonna be splitting their scruples. So giddy up for the learning, guys. Let's go get her done right now. Context is everything. 1924, guys, is a pretty smooth year. We're in the middle of the Roaring Twenties. The economy is booming. Consumer goods are flying off the shelves. Unless you're a farmer, you're probably doing pretty well economically in the United States. And in terms of foreign policy, it's a lot different than 1920. Kind of the ripples of World War I are gone. It's looking like a peaceful outlook. And Silen Cal, who was Harding's vice president, of course he died in his presidency, and um, Calvin Coolidge took over as vice president. And now, like in the spirit of Teddy Roosevelt, when McKinley died, he's gonna launch himself into the 1924 election and try to win it on his own. And like I said before, context is everything. It is a very smooth sail for Silent Cal. So Calvin Coolidge, originally from Vermont, he was the governor of Massachusetts, and he made a name for himself on the law and order side of things, much in the spirit of like a Ronald Reagan with the air traffic controllers. When the Boston police threatened to go on strike, he fired them all and brought in a whole bunch of new officers. And that really appealed, especially during the Red Scare and the fear of communism, to a lot of kind of the middle road Americans. Now, he does have a small problem, and that would be that there are still some progressive roots in the Republican Party, kind of the Teddy Roosevelt thing, and he had some challenges. Um, Hiram Johnson, the reformed governor of California, challenged him, and I love the story when he was trying to win the primary in Michigan, they put forth another Hiram Johnson on the ballot, some old guy who wasn't related, just to confuse the delegates. And Calvin Coolidge, like his predecessor, William G. Harding, is kind of a master manipulator on top of the political organizational scheme, and he's going to be able to run away with that nomination and run for president all on his own in 1924. He's going to run a pretty conservative campaign. He's going to talk about anti-lynching laws. He's going to talk about lowering taxes, keeping tariffs pretty high, and he's going to fight against this concept of expanding government with subsidies and things like that. And even though as a reform governor of Massachusetts, he was for things like the eight-hour workday, he was for um, you know banning child labor and all of that kind of groovy progressive stuff. As president, he doesn't see the federal government government is having that constitutional authority, so he very much believes in limited government states' rights. He's an economic conservative, very much in the model of how we would see the Republican Party today. But he's going to have a small problem because there are some progressive Republicans in that party, but not enough to cause him the presidency. <laughs> So the Democrats have a large problem, and that is the split in their party that's becoming evident in 1924. You have William Gibbs McAdoo, who is kind of a William Jennings Bryan Democrat. He was actually in Woodrow Wilson's cabinet as Secretary of Treasury. He's also related to Woodrow Wilson. He's his son-in-law. Um, and he is someone who's a little bit close to the Klan. He's more of like a Southern kind of Democrat. And he believes in some things like labor unions and farm subsidies and regulation of industry and things like that. But culturally and socially, this is a guy who is much closer to that Southern Democratic vibe than an urban Democratic vibe. And that urban Democratic vibe is, is growing, and that is Al Smith, who is a Catholic from New York City, who represents more of that urban, uh, ethnic, anti-Klan strain of the Democratic Party that is growing and now bumping up against this more rural, conservative Democratic strain. So after 103 ballots, I said it, 103 ballots, which is crazy, they finally both had to withdraw their names and they end up with John Davis, the compromise candidate, who represents a little bit of both. He is an urbanite, he's a Wall Street lawyer with a lot of connections to big business like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Council on Foreign Affairs, the Carnegie Institute. This is a guy that's very well connected, but he's also a former senator from West Virginia, so the Democrats are thinking that they can solidify their southern base and still appeal to some more 
urbanites with this this character John Davis and John Davis is kind of a weird guy even though sometimes he's going to come out and condemn the KKK he's also going to fight against some big reforms like child labor laws at the national level or anti-lynching laws at the national level and later on in life he's actually going to defend segregation in one of the Brown versus Board cases arguing in front of the Supreme Court for separate as equal so this John Davis character is a compromised character that really is isn't going to um, appeal to that many Democrats outside of the Deep South. But here's the larger problem, that, that there is another party in town. So Robert LaFollette, the fighting Wisconsin governor, fighting Bob, he doesn't want to be a Republican anymore. The Teddy Roosevelt progressive Republican streak that we talked about before with Hiram Johnson in California, who, who was still fighting for the nomination, would lose it in the Republican Party. The progressives want to bolt, and they're going to do it in 1916 with the progressive party. But they're not so much going to split up the Republican Party at this point, which is solidifying around a conservative base. They're going to split up the Democratic Party and really the populists and the urban northern ethnic Democrats that are going to go for La Follette instead of the more conservative uh, John Davis. So let's take a look at the election, we'll take a look at some of the big issues, and then we'll say goodbye. <laughs> So it would appear that Calvin Coolidge sounds almost a little bit like a progressive. He's trying to hold on to some of the progressive roots of the Republican Party. I mean, he's talking about the eight-hour workday. He's talking about federal legislation to go after child labor. He's talking about anti-lynching laws in terms of, you know, having some equality and talking about racial relations a little bit, although he would never condemn the KKK. But the Republicans are running a campaign on, you know, stay cool with Coolidge. Let's stay with the tide. Let's keep the peace. Silent Cal is the way to go. If you enjoy your life now, why would you change it? Coolidge is also, at least superficially, looking like he's dealing with some of the corruption problems that occurred under Harding. You have the teapot dome scandal. And even though Coolidge isn't throwing these guys out and arresting them and cleaning up Washington, it has the appearance that he's being methodical, he's being pragmatic, he's dealing with the situation. And Cal was really good at that. That looked like he was in charge, that he's a quiet guy, but he knows what he's doing, that we can trust Cal. And of course, the Davis campaign is running a much more conservative campaign. They did have Charles Bryan as the vice president, who was the brother of William Jennings Bryan, to try to appeal to that populist segment. But for the most part, they're a pretty conservative campaign. They talked a little bit about farm subsidies, some limited public work programs, but times are good. Their unemployment's pretty low. And in fact, most of their platform sounds a little bit kind of conservative and anti-progressive. They're talking about um, you know fighting against anti-lynching laws. They're talking about fighting against child labor laws. They're talking about, you know, not supporting the eight-hour workday because they believe it's a state's rights issue. So you have Calvin Coolidge, who believes in limited government. You have Davis, who believes in state's rights, which is a limited government. And you have the progressives, which are fighting for the old progressive things like regulation of the railroads and the um, ownership of public utilities like water. They're talking about huge farm subsidies and price controls to help farmers out where there's an overproduction problem. So what La Follette is doing is he's trying to create this coalition of kind of farm labor and labor unions in cities and the former Debs socialist under this umbrella of kind of pragmatic progressism in the spirit of Teddy Roosevelt. But because he's a third party, he's just not going to have enough steam. But at the end of the day, that electoral map right there shows you that this is a conservative electorate. You only have the very deep south, the former Confederate states that are voting for Davis. You have Wisconsin who goes progressive, and La Follette did pretty good in those northern western states. But it's not enough to really make a huge impact. If anything, it's it's breaking up the populist and the Democratic vote that, you know, that Charles Bryan was supposed to bring in for the Democrats. So the Democrats are going to get decimated. They're going to get 29% of the popular vote, 54% for Silent Cal, and Silent Cal is going to rack up the electoral votes and take this thing home handily. We're going to have another election before we get to the Great Depression, but you can see from 1920 and 1924 and soon in 1928 that these are Republican 
conservative elections that are electing the status quo. So giddy up for the learning, guys. We hope that you learned something. If you haven't subscribed to Hip Use History, you can do that right now by clicking that big red button. And if you haven't figured out that we have tons of other elections, you can click that button right there and go find your favorite one. Or go to www.hiphues.com and check out the video arsenal where we have over 350 fun and fucking free lectures. So there you go, guys. Um, I always say it. Where attention goes, energy flows. And we'll see you guys next time that you press my button.